Pelea, sé que va a cesar esta marea temporaria Que en ti yo viví una vida extraordinaria Que aunque no puedo entender, me consuela saber que Todo, yo sé que Todo va a estar bien Todo va a estar bien Everything will be alright The whole world's in his hands The whole world's in his hands In the darkness, in the trials He's faithful and he's true. Your whole world's in his hands. You don't know what's starting yet. Oh, 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 everything will be alright. Everything will be alright. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah. So I start yet. Oh, 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 everything will be alright. Oh. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. Todo el mundo en su mano está. Todo el mundo en su mano está. Todo el mundo en su mano está. There's a name that can silence every fear There's a love that embraces the heartache, the pain, and the tears Through my faith and my doubting, I know one thing for sure His word is unfailing, His promise secure Don't know I'll start again, everything will be alright your whole world's in his hands In the darkness, in the trials He's faithful and he is true The whole world's in his hands You don't know I'll stop yet Oh, 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 oh. Everything will be alright Oh, oh, oh. Mm, yeah uh, Father, you say everything's gonna be alright but my circumstances say I won't last through the night I need your word to hold me now, I need you to pull me through I need a miracle, a breakthrough, I need you They say you hold the whole universe in your hand But my world's falling apart like it is made of sand Am I small enough to slip through the cracks? Can you take my broken pieces and put them back? Give me faith, you believe you are on my side Open my eyes and see you working in my life Let the past remind me you'd never fail Tell my soul it is well, oh. It don't know I start again. Everything will be all right. The whole world's in his hands. Your whole world's in his hands. In the darkness, in the trials, he's faithful and he's true. Your whole world's in his hands. You don't know I start again. Te confieso a corazón abierto Que todo es muy incierto en este desierto Mi vulnerabilidad está al descubierto Siento que mi barca está muy lejos de su puerto ¿Por qué será que ya no sale el sol en mis días? ¿Por qué mis noches son tan frías? ¿Por qué será que siento que me falta algo? ¿Por qué este camino gris se siente tan largo? Sé que está sobrando aunque no te sienta Sé que está sobrando aunque no te vea Sé que voy a salir de esta odisea Sé que voy a ganar esta pelea Sé que va a cesar esta marea temporaria Que en ti yo viví una vida extraordinaria Que aunque no puedo entender Me consuela saber que Todo, yo sé que Todo va a estar bien Todo va a estar bien Everything will be alright The whole world's in his hands Your whole world's in his hands In the darkness, in the trials He's faithful and he's true Your whole world's in his hands You don't know I started yet Oh, 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 oh. Everything will be alright
got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. Todo el mundo en su mano está, todo el mundo en su mano está, todo el mundo en su mano está. There's a name that can silence every fear. There's a love that embraces the heartache, the pain, and the tears. Through my faith and my doubting, I know one thing for sure. His word is unfailing, his promise secure. Todo va a estar bien, everything will be alright. Whole world's in his hands, your whole world's in his hands. In the darkness, in the trials, he's faithful and he is true. The whole world's in his hands. You don't want to stop him yet. Oh, 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 everything will be alright. Oh, oh, oh. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, Father, you say everything's gonna be alright. But my circumstances say I won't last through the night I need your word to hold me now, I need you to pull me through I need a miracle, a breakthrough, I need you They say you hold the whole universe in your hand But my world's falling apart like it is made of sand Am I small enough to slip through the cracks? Can you take my broken pieces and put them back? Give me faith, you believe you are on my side Open my eyes and see you working in my life Let the past remind me you'd never fail Tell my soul it is well, oh. Y todo va a estar bien. Everything will be alright. The whole world's in his hands. Your whole world's in his hands. In the darkness, in the trials. He's faithful and he's true. Your whole world's in his hands. Y todo va a estar bien. Te confieso a corazón abierto Que todo es muy incierto en este desierto Mi vulnerabilidad está al descubierto Siento que mi barca está muy lejos de su puerto ¿Por qué será que ya no sale el sol en mis días? ¿Por qué mis noches son tan frías? Even though they die And whosoever lives by believing in me will never die Do you believe this? For everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to be, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to rend and a time to keep. A time to cast away and a time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. There is a time of love and a time of hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What gain has the worker for his toil? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Today we have come to celebrate the life of one who loved well, who lived well, who trusted in the Lord. We've come today to say farewell to Delvin Roger Trott. As we've come today, we hold you up in prayer that God will continue to keep you and sustain you. We will open with our opening hymn, Blessed Assurance.
and that indeed is a testimony for the believer who says blessed assurance that Jesus is mine and today we have come to celebrate Trooper's life as a man of faith one who believed and trust in God let us now look to the Lord in prayer our gracious and our sovereign God we come today, Father, in your presence. We come, God, yes, with a heavy heart. Lord, we will miss your son, your servant. For God, as he walked this earth as father, as brother, as friend, that God, indeed, he has had an impact on our lives. God, there will be a void. But God, we come to you today rejoicing in knowing that earth has no sorrows that heaven cannot cure. God, we come today, Lord, thanking you for a life well lived, a life that was loved, a life that was nurtured, God, a life who was nurturing to those with whom he came in contact with. God, we lift his children and grandchildren before your Father. That God, indeed, you will continue to hold them in the palm of your hands. That God, as they witness a man of faith, that God, they too have come to know you as Lord and Savior. So God, continue to be with them. For the host of family and friends that have gathered here today. That God, even in the midst of death, even in the midst of sorrow, that God, we would hear your voice, we would feel your presence. God, speak to us. Be with us. Comfort us, dear God. That Lord, as we move from this day, that, God, we will look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith. That even in the midst of sorrows, even in the midst of life's trials and tribulations, that, God, we can say we have a friend in Jesus. All our sins and our griefs, God, you will bear. So, God, as they go through this time of grief, God, help them to cast all their cares on you that God you would carry them, that God you will uphold them, that God as his sons prepare to eulogize their father, that God you would use them, speak through them, anoint them God, that God we will see the God that they serve and the God that their father served. That God, someone will hear you and come to know you, yes, even at a home-going celebration, as Lord and Savior. So speak, Lord. Have your way is our prayer. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen and amen. We will now have our scripture readings, after which the service will follow as printed. Thank you. 
I miss you and always love you, Father. James. Johnson. Ha, trooper. The Black <laughs> Prince. These last few years have been very hard to grapple with. And being so far away from you for most of it has made it even tougher for me. Apart from my household in Somerset, you were always the first person I made sure to see when I returned home, and the last person I saw before I left. I miss listening to your childhood stories, where you would refer to your friends with nicknames, nicknames like church, church monks, almost as if you thought I knew exactly who you were talking about. <laughs> I cherish every moment spent with you. You always made sure to make it known how much family and God meant to you. And I'm a firm believer those are the two things that kept you going so strong for so long. One thing you always told me was that you would live to be 100. You all heard that, didn't you? <laughs> but as your days became numbered, I was almost certain that wouldn't happen. But I finally realized what you meant by that. Although you physically spent 84 years on this earth, 84 great years, your spirit and love will live on to 100 and well beyond. I love you and I miss you, Paul, and I promise to keep my left foot. His brother Stuart, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 12, 9, Love must be sincere. A reminder that not all that passes for love is genuine. Yet our heart's deepest longing is to know real love. Love that isn't self-serving or manipulative, but compassionate and self-giving. Love that's not a fear-driven need for control, but a joyful commitment to each other's well-being. And that's the good news, the gospel. Because of Jesus, we can finally know and share a love we can trust, a love that will never cause us harm. To live in his love is to be free. Loving God, help us to learn the difference between real and counterfeit love, and to share Christ's love with those around us, which I'm sure my brother Dow would want us to do. I love you, brother Dow. Rest in peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Marvin, I can remember when I was about 14 years of age when Dad asked me to give him a haircut. <laughs> My dad had a barber shop in the backyard. It was a Saturday morning, and Dad told me that he had a date with a young lady that evening. I asked him who it was, but he would not give me her name. He did tell me that she lived in Trinity Road, Bayless Bay, across from St. John's Amy Church. I told him that my charge was three shillings, but I would give him a discount and only charge him two shillings, but he must pay me before I cut his hair. <laughs> I reminded him that he and his older brothers, Clipso and Scoop, all heard me for previous haircuts. <laughs> Dow was not happy with that and started to grumble. I simply said to him that if he had no money to pay, pay me, how could he take a lady out for an evening on the town, which also included dinner? <laughs> Suffice to say that Dow paid me. I gave him his haircut, he took the lady out, and the rest is his. Sister Doreen, all I have to say is that Dad was a great brother. And even though we didn't always agree, our love for one another kept our bonds strong. Sleep in heavenly peace, Dad. I love you, Doreen. Sister Elsa, because we were only a year apart, we shared many memories. But the one memory that sticks out is when we were children. Papa was taking us home from the exhibition in the horse and truck. We would jump over and then run to catch back up. 
Well, Papa saw this, and he whipped the horse gently so it would go faster. <laughs> we ran as fast as we could, and I remember crying at the same time. I thought we would never catch it, but you stayed with me, and we did catch it, and Papa would just laugh. Dal, I will miss you, and I love you. You're in God's loving arms now. I said. I wish to convey my sincere condolences to Dell's family and friends. Dell and I have been dear friends since the early 1950s. That's a long time. <laughs> we did not see each other. But when we did, we made up for lost time. Dell was one of the Howard Academy Knights that I made it my business to call at least once a month. Dell and I first met in the 1950s in high school. excelled in track and field. He was a sprinter and a long jumper. In cricket, he played with Bailey Spade and the County Cup uh, Club. In football, he played with Howard Academy, Devonshire Colts, Police, and the National Team. I remember the time when Howard Academy's football team was training at the National Stadium and there were some elite track and field athletes training there as well. And one asked Mr. Deshaun, did he have anybody on the team that could compete with him in a hundred yards dash? We knew that Dow was our fastest runner. So Mr. Jean went to Dow and said, would you compete against this Germany and so on against our fastest? And Dow said, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> You're laughing, you know Dow. <laughs> so he said, no, I'm not going to do it. So a group of us got together and went to him and said, Dow, go ahead and do it. Go ahead. And he said, okay. He beat the fellow. He beat the fellow in 100 meters. And this athlete was.
was one of the premier athletes in the country then. I had a conversation with a Mr. Augustus who taught at Francis Patton School when Dell attended and told me that Dell for a number of years had the long jump racket in the country. He was a tremendous footballer. He was very quick. He used both feet. That used to not make me feel good at all. <laughs> and he became a tremendous header of the ball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything, everything seemed to come easy to him. And of course that frustrated me because I had worked very hard at whatever I, I excelled in. I remember after training session, Mr. Shum selected a few of us to practice penalty kicks. And after taking about six hundred kicks each. I asked Dal what foot did he prefer? I asked the question because he took three with the left foot, three with the right foot, and scored every time. I was the left footer. I used the right foot to stand on and balance myself. But other than that, that was it. I said to them, what foot do you prefer? I wasn't happy when I had to become, when Mr. Jean put us together because I know he was faster, he used either foot, that had a ball. So I was at a disadvantage when I had to compete against him. <laughs> when he said that he wasn't sure of which foot Okay. 
edit and perfect it in 15, 20 minutes. That's how great that I was. As I said, he used, he was a city with a sure uh, which could be preferred. And I say to the congregation, particularly to the young man and the present man and the man who had played the game and no longer played, I ask you, how many of you can say what Dow said? Not many. If any, I'm sure we always have a favorite book. But this fellow did not. And I say that to say that Dow was an exceptional athlete. Very I hope so. You deserve it. But wherever you are, my dear friend, rest in peace.
1960, Dow met a beautiful young lady, Miriam Quedar. He recalled how he was at a party in Harlem, Bailey State, that he was smitten with her mes mesmerizing beauty, and from there a courtship developed. They married on Thursday, September 13, 1962, at St. John's Amy Church, a union which lasted 40 years. Mm. From this union, there were five children, Mark, Roger, Kimberly, Juanita, and Kiana. Dow was appointed to the Bermuda Police Service on July 6, 1964, until August 24, 1967. I guess hence that's probably the nickname Trooper. Was, um, learned, yeah. He then worked for the Bermuda government within the Public Works Department up until his retirement in 2003. He was a superintendent of solid waste management, where he was responsible for making sure all garbage con collections were done island wide. In later years, it extended to the recycling plant located in Devonshire. Shortly after his retirement, he briefly worked as a breeder at uh, Fairmont Southampton Hotel. He enjoyed meeting and talking to the guests that were there. Dow was probably best known for his sporting accomplishments, especially football. He was while, he, it was while attending Howard Academy as a teenager under the tutelage of Edward Dijon, a football star was born. Dow was an explosive, extraordinary, and naturally gifted footballer. From those who played against him, he was feared on the football. From there, the Devonshire Council was formed in 1958, consisting of all teenage boys playing against first division teams. It did not take long for the island to take notice. Unbeknown to most people, the Devonshire Cult's original colors were green and white. Dow was a prolific striker and was known to be the hardest hitter of the ball. He was able to use both feet and would often tell his grandsons that anyone could be a good player, but in order to be a great player, you had to be able to Dow said that it was Cal Bummy Simons who worked with him to improve on his heading of the ball, which at that time was his weakest skill. Garrett Dow can recall that Dow made him cry as a young boy on a bus ride home after Devonshire Colts won a game against Wellington Rovers in which Dow scored a hat trick. Dow was, was the first major footballer to come out of Hamilton Parish, which of course is known for cricket. However, once people knew about him, they would come out and specifically to watch him play. He also played for Bermuda and later played for police as well as social club. One Christmas, he told his grandsons, Andrew and Justin, that he was known as the Black Prince in the football community. Dow also played cricket in his younger years as a junior, junior and senior player for Baylor State Cricket Club. He, also captained, he was also the captain of Howard Academy Cricket it was in an Eastern Counties game at Flats Field where he caught the winning catch that enabled Baylor State to win the game. He also ran track and field and was at, and particularly um, featured in, in the sprints. Both him and Arliss Francis qualified to represent Bermuda in the Commonwealth Games sometime in the 60s, but were told there, were, there wasn't enough funds to send them. Yeah, it still goes on today. <laughs> But he knew that wasn't the real reason. Dow was so proud to know that he passes that black genes on to his children and grandchildren. Dow was always a man of principle and would never compromise on what he thought was right. He was actively involved in the civil rights movements during the 1960s. In fact, Dr. Roosevelt Brown pulled him out of the line at a theater in Hamilton leading into the theater boycott in 1959. There are so many stories about Dow during the movement and how he was passionate about equality for the black community, making sure to tell his older children to never back down or to show weakness. <laughs> Dow loved to travel and thoroughly enjoyed many trips he was blessed to go on. He, his favorite place to visit was Canada, where he visited Halifax, Toronto, Montreal, as well as Vancouver. He also traveled to many places in the U.S. His favorites being Vail, Colorado, San Antonio, Texas, and South, South Dakota and Alaska. Mexico, England, and the Mediterranean were also the top of his list. On their 25th wedding anniversary, he and Mary went to Montreal. This was extra special because this was the first trip without any of the children. <laughs> sure. 
Dale and Mary dedicated their life to God here at Apple Church in 1971. Dale's love for the Lord carried over in every aspect of his life. His faith and in God was evident, and he made sure that he, that his children knew God and encouraged them to build a rich and meaningful relationship with him. Prayer was so important to him, and he made sure to tell his children and grandchildren that he prayed for them every single day. Dow's service to the church was vast as he served in numerous capacities. Dow was a God-fearing man up until his final breath. His sheer tenacity and strength shown throughout the last years of his life was a true testament of God being with him every step of the way. Family was, family was the one thing that Dow would fight tooth and nails for. The core values that he instilled in his children are evident even up until today. <clears throat> values that have been passed down to his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. He was supported in all, children, all of his children and grandchildren's endeavors, whether it was academic, sports, personal, or family accomplishments. Next to Mary, he was their biggest fan. And despite what Kim has to say, Dow's favorite was no, no other than his baby, Kina. His favorite time of the year was Cup Match, and up until his later years, he, was, he, he always attended the game. So it was fitting that God called him home on the second day of Cup Match this year. Dow's legacy is strongly intact and will live on throughout his children's lives and generations to come. We will always love you, Daddy. Dow and his family, Dow will be lovely, lovingly cherished and remembered by his children, Mark, Elena, Roger, Sasha, Kim, Anthony, Bonita, Troy, and Kina, brothers Marvin, Denise, Stuart, Pat, Trot, um, sisters Darlene and Will Francis, and Elsa, Trot, um, grandchildren, Kenesha, Andrew, Damian, Alexander, Shane, Justin, Desiree, Mateo, Aaron, Jace, and Allegra, uh, great grandchildren, Nazori, Ozuzu, DeAndre, Lazar, Nairi, Mateo, Alea, and Kaden, brothers in law, Navin, and Charlotte Goddard, Al Seymour Sr., sisters in law, Paulette, Paulette Patty, Marilyn Thompson, yours truly, special daughter, Tammy Warren, and numerous relatives and friends, too, too many to mention. It would be remiss of me if I didn't mention on behalf of the family, they would also like to acknowledge special friends, Mrs. John Storm, um, Mr. Joe Stevens, and Mr. and Mrs. Cranston Warren. And this was lovingly submitted by the family. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Boy, with all that, man, it's so nice to know that I came from Red and Red. <laughs> and yes, the trooper was really a trooper. But I'm here to do the, the words of comfort to this family. And I'm going to do the words of comfort right out of the God, the book of God. Deuteronomy would say to us that do not, and this is speaking to the family and friends, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Weeping may endure for a night. But because we know where our loved one has gone, joy will stop by in the morning. And John would say, you will grieve. Amen? You will grieve. But your grief will turn to joy. Because there's going to be joy in the morning. You're not going to grieve forever. Amen? And Matthew goes on to say, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. God is going to comfort you each and every day. Yes, you're going to continue to, until you leave this earth, you're going to continue to, to, to 
oftentimes think about your father. We talked about it, Mark and, and you guys. Um, you're going to think about your father. You might drop a tear here and there. But that weeping is only for a period of time because God will give you joy in its place. Amen? And Romans will say, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So, so trust in the Lord. When you get those moments, just trust in the Lord with all your heart. And, and it goes on to say, lean not to your own understanding. Our biggest problem is we try to figure it out ourselves. But God wants you to leave it up to him. And he makes you a promise, family. He makes you a promise. He will direct your pathway. Amen? Amen. And then the psalm, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And all his saying is the fact that, yes, we're going to walk through some valleys of some difficulties. There's going to be some difficulties in our lives, and that's the valley. But if you trust in God, God will be with you. God will be with each and every one of you if you just were to put your trust in God. Yes, we heard some stories about uh, Dow, the trooper. Um, I was a bit on the younger side, but I remember the trooper before I, before I was coached by my greatest coach that's in that corner over there, uh, trooper, trooper was saying to me that you have a good right and you have a good left foot, Mr. Dane, so I think you continued on as I got to Devonshire Coats. But these are the things that he would say because we were, we were yard and, and you know, sometimes the police couldn't even get through Redner Road because we played in the street. And, and every now and then, because Trooper then became a cop, so every now and then he'll come out and, and tell us to come out of the street and play in, in, in the yard, play on the yard of the Crichton, so play in the yard. And of course, the yard at, the, at, at, at his house was a bit on the small side, so you can hit a six without even looking. <laughs> but nonetheless, he took care of us, and I, I'm convinced now that, that we're listening to this, that, that uh, Trooper was, at that time, the only cop in Redner Road. Well, Larry followed Trooper <laughs> and became the second cop in Redner Road. And before he retired, I could remember him saying some things. Trooper, Trooper was tough. Trooper was tough. And at that time, the, the police service was predominantly uh, uh, white. And Trooper would say some things like, just be careful. Don't compromise. That's the word that he will always tell me. Do not compromise. And I was so, so disappointed that he, he, he only lasted three years. And of course, he didn't tell me to leave. But I ended up doing 41 and a half. And I guess that patience came from Trooper because even in his spirit, even in my spirit, uh, the trooper was looking out for me because I was the only one that came out of Red and Red that decided to be a cop. But family and friends, you don't have to weep. God has got your back. Amen? Amen. Amen. And Mark, you know I've told you over and over again, you and Roger, that if you need to weep a little bit, pick up the telephone, okay? Praise the Lord.
Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon. I'm Jesse. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, I spoke to my brothers and sisters and I asked them about getting Jesse to sing, and they said, no problem. And the reason I asked Jesse, because Jesse just lost his parents. Mm -hmm. So I knew he would understand. Mm -hmm. To Reverend Ruth. Pastor Larry, Mr. Dean, and everyone else, Jay, and everyone else that's here today. On behalf of Bludger, Kim, Juanita, Kina, and his myriad of grandchildren and great-grandchildren, I want to thank you for coming. <laughs> My brother and I, when we were more or less told by a certain gentleman, not calling any names. Name. Yeah. This won't be a, u a usual eulogy. Don't be surprised when we caught in on each other. That's how he raised us. So this gentleman said, you know what? You guys are going to do your father's eulogy. And the first thing we both did was look at each other. <laughs> and then look at him. <laughs> and you know what? He was right. So before we start, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Almighty God, we come before your throne of grace and mercy through your son Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who sits on your right hand, interceding on our behalf. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to stand before you. We thank you, Lord, that you, the Almighty, held Delwyn Trot in the palm of your hand. Amen. That you blessed him uh -huh. with 84 years. Yes. That you continue to watch over him even in his times of strife. Hmm. Even when the doctors told us there was nothing else they could do. Our response was, it's all in God's hands. Mm -hmm. For we recognize that Darwin's days were numbered not by his sickness. Mm -hmm. They were numbered by the word of God that says all of our days are numbered. Mm -hmm. So there's only one individual who sits high, who determines when our life story shall end. Amen. Mm -hmm. Not the illness, not even death, mm -hmm. because thou, when Trooper tried, died knowing the Lord. So he already has victory. Because one day he shall rise. Amen. He shall see his God. Amen. So we come before you today, Roger and I, thanking you on behalf of our family and our sisters that you gave us a great example. A great example. So we now ask that you'll be with us. Anoint us both. And let me speak such that your will is done and not ours. Amen. In Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. Hallelujah. So, our Father, and, I, and one of the things that Roger and I are going to do, yeah, we have notes here, but to be honest, a lot of these notes probably wouldn't even get spoken. Because the one thing we did learn is that the Holy Spirit leads. Amen. And where he leads, follow. In fact, the nickname Trooper, you wouldn't believe where he got that name from. And because he told me this morning the story, because he got it from one of my sisters, Kim, I'm going to let Roger tell you that story. <laughs> Before I mess it up. <laughs> Thanks, caught me by surprise, but it's all good, praise God. Um, yeah, so Kim tells, was reminding me when we were talking about where Dad, Trooper, got his name from, Dow got his, that nickname from. And he said, while he was a police officer, he's always had the police bike, and he used to have to go on the base. And one of the officers down there, he'd see this one officer each time he'd have to go onto the base on his police bike. And the police officer would say, hey, you're like a trooper. I'm going to call you Trooper. And the interesting thing is, my dad had a really close friend, Bill Farbett, and I think he was one of the few people, he never called my dad by his name. Always called him by Trooper. And so Mark's going to just elaborate a little more on Trooper. And we didn't rehearse this, guys. Okay, just in case you think we did, we didn't. Trooper. So Roger and I were curious. We were saying, Trooper, what's a Trooper? police officer, whatever. So we went and looked it up. And there were two definitions that caught our eye. The first one was this. When someone looks at you and says, you're a trooper, they're trying to tell you that they think you're strong, especially if there's a tough situation at play. It's usually a compliment acknowledging your ability to soldier through adversity. The second one said, a brave or stalwart person, a reliable, uncompromising person, a stone supporter or colleague. And so Mr. Dan was talking, and he's telling about, you know, how my daddy was. And, you know, as we guys grew up, you know the amazing thing was? We knew every Devonshire coach player before we even met him. We knew who Ray Morgan was. We knew who Alex Romeo was. We knew who Junk Storm was. We knew who Donald Dan was. We knew who Poker, Poker Rich, Kenneth Richardson was. We knew all these guys because he made it a point to tell us who they were. And the one that always stood was Edward Dijon. My father told us Dijon knew nothing about football. In fact, boxing was his thing, I think. But he taught him some lessons. And he used to give us all these little small um, synonyms like VIP, volume increases pressure. If you could volley as a forward, then you could increase pressure on the defenders because they couldn't stop you because you got volley. You know, and, 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 and he took those little and he made us realize they applied to life. They weren't just about football. So that's why he told Justin, and he told Jace, and he told us his grandsons that were in football, kick with both feet, because that's what he told us. He told us, you want to be good footballers, you have to kick with both feet, even if you have a favorite foot. And so we learned that growing up. You know, as we thought about him, there was a scripture that came to mind. And the story we're telling, it's almost like when you go to a movie sometimes, you will see shows and sometimes they will play the, the back part first and they'll move to the present. So we're gonna tell the back part, well I'm gonna move like the back part and it's gonna give you some present. And then we're gonna finish it all. <laughs> Psalm 144 verses one to two says this. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and whom I take refuge. You know, as we moved through our life and we thought about different things about our father, you know, we recognized that God was teaching him and training him for all the battles he would face in life, all of them. Like we could tell you some stories. Like, I'll tell you one story. My father was a police officer, so he was on his cycle squad. And one day, I was sitting in the office, Roger and I, in the kitchen with my mama, seeing the rat and And all of a sudden, I started to have a seizure. My mama panicked, like mothers would, because I didn't know what was going on. 
So she called my daddy. They managed to get him to the police radio service, and he comes blaring down the road with his best friend, um, um, Pop Sharif Tuckwer, changed his name later in life. Kim's grandfather, in fact. They come racing down the road on the bikes. Sirens blaring into the yard, kicks his bike or jumps up, runs in. What, what, what's, he still having it? No, he's all right there. Um, you already called Dr. Campbell? Yes. All right, so now we've got to get him to the, to the doctor. Yeah, no problem, I've got it covered. Snatches me up, puts me on the bike, front of the bike. My mom was trying to kick out the door. Dad, what are you doing? You can't take him on the police bike. Watch me. <laughs> <laughs> so with Sharif in front of him, blurring going up the road, there we go up Shelly Bay Street, North Shore, to Dr. Campbell's office. That was my father, family first. He didn't care if he got fired. His son was having a problem, and he was going to resolve it. You know, Roger's going to tell a story. I'm not going to get too much, but he'll tell a story about himself when he was a baby. You'll see that my father was it's not just a gentle giant at times, but he is a man who was not prepared to settle for nothing less than the best. He didn't have a lot. He didn't leave us a lot, but he did left us one thing, L-O-V-E, lots of love. You see, during the last few days of his illness, we'd go visit him at King Edward. And so as each one of us would come in, he'd always look up, oh, Roger, Kim, we need to Kena, Ma. And then we ultimately would get to the point where we'd go over to him because his hearing wasn't too sharp. So he get to his right ear because his left ear was his best hearing ear until he had an infection. This is the things he had to fight with. He had an infection, and then he couldn't hear out his left. So we would go up to him and say, hey, Dad, you got any pain? How you feeling? No pain. No pain. That's what he would say, no pain. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting there watching him, and you're saying to yourself, is he just telling us this? Because he's not hinting or letting on that he has any pain. And so we realized that he never complained, you know, during his illness. He never went to God and said, like, why me? Why I gotta go through this? Because for us, and I'm sure his brothers and sisters would tell you, my father was probably one of the healthiest guys you ever gonna meet. Roger and I, one day we decided we were going running. And so we took a jog, we went down Middle Road, up to Corkscrew Hill, came down Corkscrew Hill, up Trimming End Hill, and down South Shore, back to Vermont Valley View where we were staying, and collect the seal. And my father was right there with us. Mm -hmm. He didn't ask us could he come, he just came. <laughs> but that's the type of person he was, that's the type of fitness level he had. So to see him go through sickness, that was, un that was really something we had never encountered in our lives. So it was hard to watch him go through that for us. But he was teaching us a lesson. And this is the lesson. So I'm going to use some scripture, because my father loved scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, Romans 8, 38 and 39 says this, and we saw it become a reality for him. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So my father was a believer. There's one thing he gave us. Let me say it down behind Shelly Bay. My father made sure that when we were young, that we went to Sunday school here. We could do everything all week, but Sunday morning, I don't care what complaint you might have had, what illness you thought you had, right. you was getting dressed, and you were going to Sunday school. That's right. That's right. And I'm thankful for him for that, because he was doing one thing the scripture says, train up a child and they should yeah. go and he will not depart from it. You see, because all of us have departed at some point in time and walked the wrong roads. But when you're trained up properly and the foundation's given, you come back. Mm -hmm. 
you come back. My dad knew that. But what he did was he trained us by example. Because in 71, here in this church with us all present, he gave his life to God with my mother. Amen. You can't just tell somebody to do something. You have to show them. So he didn't just tell us, he showed us. Amen. You see, before I turn it over to my brother, Trooper knew the essence of this scripture too. Philippians 4.19. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. See, often we think our riches just come from money or these physical things that we can attain, a house, a car, you name it. But my father knew the greatest riches came from God himself, Amen. everlasting life. Because every day when you wake up, it's because God's grace and mercy allows you to do that. When you sleep at night, there's nothing that you do to keep yourself alive. It's the closest you come to death. My father understood that. He knew that when he woke up in the morning, that's because God wanted him to do something else for him. James 1, verse 12, sums it up really the lessons he was trying to teach us. Blessed is the one who preserves under the trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised for those who love him. Mm -hmm. My daddy was teaching us during those last few days that no matter what happened, it would not be his will, but God's will would be done. Amen. 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 You know, being able to say, not my will, but God's will be done indicates there's been a surrender, which for the believer is a change in strategy. <laughs> it's a change in strategy. Now I want to talk a bit about how the war that Trooper fought and the, and the strategy he used, the weaponry Trooper used and relied upon to fight his battles and how it drastically changed over time. For instance, I remember a period during the Black Power Movement that on several occasions, Trooper would tell Mark and I as we were leaving home on our way to school at Francis Patton, Mark and Roger, come here. Listen, I want you to remember, if a white boy hits you, <laughs> you hit him back. <laughs> Never allow a white boy to hit you. <laughs> After telling us this, he pinned the black power button on our shirts, raised his fist, say black power, and send us off to school. <laughs> but, you know, now that I think about it, the, the interesting thing was Francis Patton was 98% black. <laughs> With a few Portuguese children. And the truth is, we didn't consider him white. <laughs> Thank God there were no white kids that I had to fight. But as I reflect back on this, it demonstrated his commitment to doing his part in ending racial inequality and championing justice for those he believed didn't have the same privileges as others. My, my, my. Even though years later, he would admit and apologize to my brother and I that that strategy that he told us to hit <laughs> was wrong. But, but that was the miracle in his transformation. That was a miracle. This is the same man who told me, hit him. Telling me not, no, you don't hit. You gotta love him, you gotta pray for him. You gotta bless him. And, and let me give you a story today. So all my life I wanted to go Barkley. Like I had cousins that went Barkley. I could always see myself wearing that green and gold tie. So Mr. Dan happened to be down in Francis Patton. I was in um, what they call Standard 4, or what they call P P5 today. So I was a year before the senior year. But I got to do the exam. 
because they thought I academically I was good enough, along with a late, young lady called Yerni Jones, who's now Yerni Junis. So we both took the exam with the, with the senior um, students. Long story short, we both did well. She got into Whitney. That was her first choice. Barclay was my first choice. I remember Principal Robinson calling me ahead of a nonsense to all these kids where their schools they got, telling me, um, unfortunately, you didn't, um, you're going to have to do another year, the last year, that you didn't get accepted. Man, I went in crying until my daddy. My father said to my mama, it'll be sorted out tomorrow morning. <laughs> No joke. And he just said, and my mom said, well, I'm coming with you. Well, you can come. <laughs> my father took my mother to Barclay Institute the next day. Didn't ask for no appointment. Went to the office, knocked on the door. He went past his secretary, knocked on the door. The principal who named Nameless had just started too. Boy. So he walks in, and the principal knew him. He says, hey, Dow, how are you doing? Don't know how, hey, Dow, me. And my daddy grabs him and pulls him across the desk. Why is my son in Barkley? That's right. I'm, t I'm telling you, know, my mama said I had to jump between him because I could tell the next thing come was a right hook. <laughs> so he left. Next year, final year, Francis Patton, I'm going to finally get to go to Barkley. Because I know I'm, I'm finishing in the top two students anyway. So there's no way I could deny me this time. Take Brindy Paper home. Seven slots for which school you want to go to, from your first to your seventh. What do you think he does? He writes down Work Academy. Seven times. Seven times. <laughs> what is this work? Where is Work Academy? I knew nothing about these schools. Anybody get in? Orientation. My mama goes, he doesn't even go. <laughs> My mama goes. So I'm sitting there, and all I could see is all these white kids coming in. <laughs> and I looked at my mama and said, are you kidding me? The guy that made me wear black power buttons is sending me to a white school? <laughs> I turned and I said, I'm not going here. <laughs> when I got home, I told him the same thing. He said, oh, you will be. <laughs> That's what Roger said, the transformation. He understood some things. Continue. Talk about the transformation. And, and what, he, what he understood was the value of family. What he, what he understood was that without Christ in your life, life is empty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what he understood, and he lived by that. See, in the in-between years of that 1971, time when both he and my mom came up at this very altar. Um, Reverend Cyril Butterfield was preaching, preaching that day. And they both gave their hearts to the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Which is why we sing Blessed Assurance, because Blessed Assurance was actually playing when they gave their hearts to the Lord. My mind, my mind. So in between those years that Trooper got saved and transitioned, right, his transition, he was able to work on fine-tuning his war strategy. <laughs> How did he do that? He traded the bar stool for the church pew. He exchanged drinking with his mates to spending more time at home with us. He gave up spending countless hours swapping stories with his mates at the bar to spending countless hours feasting on God's word. Amen. Amen. There were many times I would come home, my dad would be like marked up his Bible and, 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 and as he was learning, he would share with us. <clears throat> he cast aside having what I call a pseudo communion. <laughs> you, you know that communion they have at certain social <laughs> places when the bell is wrong. <laughs> that communion. Well, he traded that to regularly participating in the Lord's Supper at church. Amen. Amen. You see, Trooper had discovered a, a fail-proof strategy, a, a strategy that is a few thousand years old and stands the test of time. 
a strategy the Apostle Paul outlines in Ephesians 6, 13 to 19, where he says, therefore, therefore, put on the whole armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, yeah, yeah. not if, yeah, yeah. when it comes, you live long enough, it's going to come you may be able to stand the test, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done that, to stand. Stand. Amen. stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Trooper learned the first thing he had to do with his new strategy was to stand in truth. Not run, not walk, not even crawl. This, strategy, this type of strategy was actually new to him. Because he's used to doing and doing and making it happen and working it and, and, and doing all that. But there were some lessons he learned from his younger day, days, like when he was playing football under Mr. Dijon, Edward Dijon, who was a serious disciplinarian, according to my dad and others. He had, he had prepared him with the skill set to be disciplined in learning how to stand. Trooper would tell us stories of the original Devonshire cults training regime, their commitment to fitness, and the countless hours he spent mastering the basics and shooting just as good with both feet. How Cal Bummy Simons pulled him aside and, and, and taught him how to head a ball. You heard me? How somebody else pulled him aside and taught him something. how somebody else pulled him aside yeah, yeah, yeah. and taught him something. That's what our community was like. That's powerful. We have to pass on what we learn. I remember Dennis Rainwright telling me that Trooper was a fantastic striker. He had learned to stand firm in Jesus, who is his truth. Jesus is the truth. It's not a concept, not an idea. And that's how Dad lived. Jesus is a real person. God in the flesh came down from heaven to die for me. And you. And he says, listen, you don't even have to be, be afraid of coming to him. You know why? Because he says, there is therefore now no condemnation. That's right, that's right. Yeah. No condemnation. Once you accept Christ, there is no condemnation right. at all. Whatever your friends from the past try to throw in your face, guess what? There is no condemnation. Amen. Amen. Along with the belt of truth, Trooper learned the importance of keeping the blessed parade of righteousness in place. During one of my Saturday visits with him, I used to visit him every week and cut his hair and give him a shave. That was so special. I actually missed that. As a matter of fact, I said to my wife, I think it was last night or a night before, I said, oh man, no, we were driving yesterday. And I says, she said, oh, we're going to do this one Saturday. I says, oh no, I'm going to give my dad. And I said, oh, man, it's not hair. I can't give him his haircut and shave. But I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to do that. Thankful for being able to give back to my dad. Thankful for the seeds that he sowed in me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Parents out there, young people out there with kids, I want to encourage you, sow the seeds. Sow the seeds. Because no matter where we go in life, once that seed is planted, it never, ever, ever leaves. Yes, sir. You can go as far off track as you want, yes, but once that seed is planted, you have something you can draw back on. Amen. And that seed at some point will bear fruit. That's just how it works. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Trooper understood the greatest battle in life involved giving up every effort to make himself right. Yes, sir. We live, we live in an age of self-help, positive thinking. But my word tells me, and this is how my dad lived, my word tells me that I am righteous in Christ, that Christ is my righteousness. Yes, sir. 
So as I'm standing, I stand in Christ's righteousness, not my own. Amen. Amen. Not my own. I take no credit for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when, when, for those of us who are children in, 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 in the Lord, when the Lord looks at us, you know what he sees? He sees himself. He sees his son. His son. That's who and what he sees. He sees a reflection of himself. Amen. And this is why the gospel is so critical. Because when we accept the gospel and we're walking in the gospel, we, we, we have the privilege of interacting with each other, not on the basis of behavior, but on the basis of identity in Christ. Yes, yes. yes sir. Identity in Christ. That is the goodness of God. We're saved by grace through faith alone, not works, lest any man should boast. Trooper understood that. Through his countless hours of study, Trooper decided to get rid of all his old shoes and buy some new shoes, which the Apostle Paul calls the gospel of peace. I remember one Christmas, we visited our aunt, and she gave my brother and I toy guns. They had sponge bullets and mimicked the sound of machine guns for Christmas gifts. So you, I'm like, oh yeah, this is it. Like, Mark and I are going to go here and have some fun. We're going to battle. I remember looking at Trooper at dead to see what his response would be. You see, because up, up to that point, we weren't allowed to play with guns. Couldn't even play with them. He just looked at me, never said a word, didn't say nothing. So I was like, oh, cool, what's got free, boy? My <laughs> man's giving us guns, boy. We could go home and play. Then he ain't said nothing. <laughs> so the moment we arrived home from my aunt's house, my exuberance and youthful dreams were shattered. <laughs> when Trooper said, um, Mark and Roger, come here, please. Oh, no. Pass me those guns. I mean, I didn't even remember him saying, please. <laughs> I, I, I remember Mary, our mom, protesting in her own way, because the gifts were from her sister. And, but Trooper, true to form, refused to back down from his position. His sons would not be allowed to play with guns because he said they were meant to kill people. We were not even allowed to play with the cap guns, as popular as they were. I realize now that he was prepared to fight as long as there was no loss of life. As noble as, as this sounds, Trooper realized that lasting peace and equality will only come about through the gospel of peace. Trooper walked in the gospel, the good news of peace that shows God came in the flesh as Jesus to save us from our sins. He also took up the shield of faith, <laughs> which he was able to extinguish all the fiery darts, his illness any other financial challenges that he and my mom went through. I remember there was two stories that I came to mind. I'll just mention one, because the other one with Ottawa Simmons was mentioned. When I was young, talking about taking up the shield of faith, I was really ill, and my mom was taking me to the doctor. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with me, didn't know. Just didn't know, ran tests. So my dad, after one doctor visit, he came in and he said, Roger, you were just in pain, excruciating pain. My mom was distraught. He was a baby too. That picture you saw of my father holding, him, holding, holding like this, a baby, that was Roger. He held me up. He said, Roger, I held you up. And he said, Lord, just heal my son. Heal my son. And he said, immediately, immediately. Not five minutes later, not an hour later, not two minutes later. He said, immediately, Roger, you stopped crying. And you started smiling, just like that. He said he got on his knees, and he and my mom just wept, pri cried, and praised the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Talk about faith. He forgot the most important thing, though, about his audience and said, My father made a promise to God then and there mm -hmm. that he would give his son back to the Lord. That's right. Yes, he did. And I shouldn't have forgotten that, too. I had it written down, but because that was something he always reminded me about. He constantly told me that story right up until, <laughs> until. Right up until, as he matured in faith, he used the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and prayer as the foundation of our family nights, mm -hmm. that he and Mary made it mandatory mm -hmm. for us to be. Every Wednesday night, right you guys? Every Wednesday. We weren't allowed to have any other plans. I'm talking up into my late teens. Couldn't have any other plans. Wednesday night was family nights. We'd have games. We'd have fun. We'd have a, he'd have a short Bible study and prayer. And each of us would have to pray. And then my dad would finish out in prayer. And when I think about it now, some of his prayers would be so long that I think one or two my sisters would fall asleep. <laughs> But there are some moments I cherish because the seed is planted. Yes, my brother, the seed is planted. He was planting seeds, even though I didn't fully appreciate it. And it's only now as my brother and I were preparing this eulogy that I realized that how much he loved us, the depth to which he loved us. Talking about his transformation, I remember one time, as we were staying a couple of houses behind here, this church, and he sat us all on the couch. He said these talks with us, right? They used to irritate me too. Um, I'll be honest, they used to irritate me, because you know, your parents and kids want to go outside and play, right? Daddy wants to talk, <sighs> there we go. And he said, listen, you guys, I don't want you ever to smoke. Smoking's bad for you. So my sister Kim looks at him, Says, but daddy, you smoke. My dad wasn't a heavy smoker, but he had his little package of cools that every now and then he'd go, you know, wherever he went and smoke socially. And he said to her, he looked her straight, I'll never forget this. He looked her in the eyes, he said, Kim, you are absolutely right. Go inside, get my cigarettes, and bring them back to me. Kim went inside, got the cigarettes, gave them to him. He tore them up, threw them in the trash, and said, I will never smoke again. My, my. And didn't a day after that. Amen. But that was the type of man he, used, he was. So I'm going to close it up. And I want to re repeat his favorite scripture. We need to read it, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, Amen. and he shall direct your path. You know, that's probably the greatest lesson my father gave us. He gave us a lot. Told me guys how to play cricket. Mm -hmm. He used to irritate my mama, because on a rainy day, the cricket game still went on in the kitchen. Right. Now them boys are gonna break a window. Yeah, and I'll fix it. Came home every day, even when he was tired. March just on to Shelly Bay Beach. Swim, come back. Came home every day during the summer, New Year's tired. Roger and I be outside and involved in heavy cricket games, and he come out and play. Mm -hmm. For those of you who were at the viewing last night, Roger and I had the first turf wicket in Bermuda. Don't be fooled when they say Somers had had it. It was Roger and I. Dow Trot created the first turf wicket for his sons. <laughs> Down here, behind Shelly Bay. That's the type of father he was. See, he didn't just believe in telling us stuff. He showed it by his actions. You know, I think about a lot of things about my dear. And this one story always comes back. I was going to go up to university, my first year at Bermuda College. 
Well, like, who thought I was anyway? First year of Bermuda College. And I got straight A's. So I figured I'd apply to all these scholarships. So I'm going to get at least one. I didn't get one. Not one. Man, I came in. Every time a letter came, said, thank you, no, unfortunately, no, no, no. I told my daddy right there in front of my mama, I'm up, that's it. I'm going to work. Forget this school thing. Because I knew my parents could not afford to send me. I had to get a scholarship. That was it. He looked me straight in the face and he said, boy, if I have not taught you one thing, it's this. You never quit, even when they think they have you done. You're going back off to college. You're getting another set of straight A's, and then you're going off to university with scholarships. Well, I went back. Hmm. I got straight A's, and I ended up with three scholarships. But that wasn't the big one. I was doing a summer student tutelage at Price Waterhouse, which was Cooper and Lines, a child of the Contents. And so one lunch hour, Vic Garcia, who's no longer with us, was the human resource manager. And he said, Mark, you got anything planned for lunch? I said, not really. He says, well, you're going to lunch with me today. OK. So we went to lunch. And an elderly gentleman walked in, a white gentleman with another gentleman, low order, and this uh, black lady. And it was. Um, they were all lawyers. At the end of the, and they, they didn't say anything. We had the lunch, didn't say nothing. I'm sitting there saying, why are these people here? They ain't said nothing. So at the end of the lunch, the elderly gentleman said, Mr. Trout, I was the chairman of the uh, Harry Butterfield Scholarship. You, didn't, you were one of our finest, but you didn't get it. So I said, oh, OK. He said, but my, I was so impressed, and the committee was so impressed. So I went and talked to my wife. And so we decided we're going to give you something for schooling. So he went in his pocket and, you know, checkbooks in, wrote out a check, put it in an envelope, gave it to me, says, I don't want you to look at it. You take it home to your parents, and in the presence of your parents, then you open it. I wanted to open that envelope so bad. <laughs> Mr. Garcia said to me, do you want me to hurl it? I said, I got it. But I was tempted. So anyway, I got home, called my mom and daddy. They came in. My mom was like, well, what's up, what's up? My daddy said, what's up? I passed the envelope to him first. He opened it up. And he started to cry. So I looked at him and I said, what's wrong? Because I thought it was, you know, what, something bad happened? That's why the guy said, don't open it. <laughs> and he just passed it to my mama. And my mama looked at it and she just said, whoa. And then he said to me, I'm crying because I thought that gentleman there was one of the most prejudiced white men I'd ever known. <laughs> and he had given me, a he had given me the same value of the scholarship, but in US dollars. And I was going to school in Canada, and, he, and the US dollar was two to one, so I had a $10,000 scholarship. <laughs> and he said to me then, life has a way of showing you people's true colors when you rely on other people to show you what they might be. Get to know a person first before you think the some way. Don't let other people lead you. And that story, that, that situation always stayed with me. Because if I were to call the gentleman's name, I'm sure some of you people in my father's age would think the same thing, that the gentleman was so prejudiced. And for the three years I was in college at Acadia, every year his wife and he wrote me a check for $5,000. I had more money than I could ever want. My father taught us, <laughs> whenever you think the mountains too big, or the valley too deep, or the hill too high, think about Isaiah 54:10. For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will remain. My covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. Trooper taught us that God's unfailing love and covenant peace would always remain 
with him and us. So when during his end times, his heart was warmed. There was no pain because God had soothed it. Mm -hmm. And any fear he had was totally removed. So as we close, my brother and I, we want to say this to Trooper in honoring him. We're going to read it together. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 to 8. You, you have fought, fought the good fight. Mm -hmm. You have finished the race. Mm -hmm. You have kept the faith. Yeah. Now so there is in store for you the, the crown of righteousness, righteousness yeah. which, which the Lord, the righteous, righteous judge, will award to you on that great day. And, and not, not only to you, but, but also to all who have longed long for his, his appearing. Amen. You see, truth around that race. His God has grown. So I'm going to speak directly to my nieces and nephews. Don't let the world shape you. Because you had a great, great papa. And he understood that. That's why he changed his life. Because he didn't want you guys just to be great athletes. As Mr. Dan said, he was a great athlete. Today's Royal Gazette warmed our hearts because there's a story in there about him, written by Colin Thompson. And it talked how great he was. Mr. Dan's comments, Clyde Bass. Clyde said he tried to emulate him. And let me tell you this story. When Roger and I were young, last one. The last one. <laughs> we used to be outside playing football. And my daddy, whenever West Ham were playing and it was on BBC radio, because it was on radio, yeah, not TV, he would call us inside. He didn't care if we were mad. Sit down and listen to this match. And listen for the name Clyde Bass. Every time the commentator said it. So it was an honor to read that Clyde Bass said he emulated our father, your papa. Mm. Trust me, it was an honor because Clyde Bass is probably the greatest footballer we've ever produced. So Roger Dalvin Trott, also known as Trooper, you were the best of the best, our unsung hero. Rest in peace. Mm -hmm. And until that great grading up morning, mm -hmm. we will cherish the love and life lessons you gave all of us forever. Amen. 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 That was one of the best eulogies I've ever heard. To speak about their father in that manner. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Our closing hymn song is Every Praise. Wonderful. It's one of